Um, Mr. Forbes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here. I'm going to try to bring us back to what this committee normally does and deal with defense issues. Um, Ranking Member Smith alluded to the fact that many on this side of the aisle are a little reluctant to raise revenues and, uh, or tax the American people more. And, and he's right, because it really doesn't matter how much new revenue you raise if you squander it on $800 billion stimulus packages or uh, health care agendas that destroy American businesses and jobs they created. It doesn't do us any good to raise the revenue. But the purpose of this committee is not to determine tax policy or Social Security, Medicare entitlements. It is to defend and protect the United States of America. And you three gentlemen have 120 years of experience between you, over four decades each one of you have. And during that period of time, I dare say that every Marine, sailor, soldier, or airman that got up in the morning and put on their uniform and looked in the mirror never questioned who they were or who America expected them to be. We expected them to be part of the greatest military in the world. And secondly, you three know better than any of us that no matter how good those men and women who serve in our military may be, we must have a consistent and correct military strategy if we're going to be the greatest military in the world. The real battle we're facing is who will define who those men and women in our military are and who will write the strategy that will determine their success or failure. The question is, will it be bureaucrats who have stared for years at spreadsheets or admirals and generals who have stared for decades in the eyes of our enemies? Now, I know who I choose, but I don't know who this Congress will choose, and I don't know who this White House will choose. And I will tell you this, um, as I look, General Pace, you, you mentioned um, that we have to have two cornerstones. We have to have a strong military and a strong economy. And that's exactly what the Chinese defense minister said in December of 2010 if they're going to rejuvenate China. And one of the things that concerned me is General Breedlove sat where you sat, and he said if China says they're going to do something, they're going to do it. If they say they're going to have 300 J-20s in five years, they're going to have 300 um, J-20s in five years. But I look at us, and we had a QDR this administration came out with in February 2010. In 18 months, they're throwing it, abandoning it, walking away from it, and saying we've got to totally change it. We get weapons programs, and, you know, we fail to stick with them. We end up buying fewer planes, tanks, et cetera, canceling the program. We came out with our military just months ago and said if you find $178 billion in efficiencies, we're going to reprioritize it and put it in places important in the military. And four months later, we come back and say, now we're going to cut another $400 billion out. The Chinese right now are developing and attracting talented military professionals, and our professionals and our military have to be looking and saying, where are we going tomorrow? What's the future for me, for my profession, for my family? And the QDR independent panel looking at our QDR force structure says it might not be sufficient today to assure others that the United States can meet its treaty commitments. So, so my question to the three of you, with all this expertise that you have, is this. It doesn't matter in the long run whether we just can't afford it or whether we just don't want to spend the money. The risk is there if we don't do what we need to do to defend the United States of America. With the curve that you see moving with China, with their modernization and what they're doing, and the curve that you see us going in, what concerns you about the out years in that curve? if we don't do something and change it. And I'd love to have your, all three of your comments on that. You don't know when the date is, but there's a tipping point. Let me just use uh, nuclear weapons, if I may, as an example. Um, I was part of the discussions about reducing nuclear weapons, and as remember the Joint Chiefs, my recommendation was, yes, that we should reduce uh, nuclear weapons from what we had, uh, to what we had to what we have now. And part of that um, strategy was that the triad would be not just uh, ground-based and uh, air-delivered and missiles, but that that triad would become one piece of the new triad, which would also include a very strong conventional armed force and an industrial base uh, that could respond to national emergencies. And we were all comfortable with that. And the nation has funded two of those three legs. We have not funded the uh, industrial base part of that. That's another discussion. There is a point, um, and unclassified numbers, I think Chinese have about 300 nuclear weapons. Right now, if we have 2,200 and they've got 300, they're probably not sitting there thinking to themselves, let's spend the money on adding 
to our nuclear arsenal. They've got plenty to do what they need to, do, to defend themselves, and they're probably not th thinking, let's allocate those resources. There's a number someplace out there, as we come down to it, that they is, might say to themselves, hmm, all we need to do is build a couple hundred more, and we'll have absolute parity with the United States. Let's do that. And you can take that same logic and apply it to ships and aircraft carriers, of which they now have one. How many are they going to build? I don't know. So as we allow ourselves to have a smaller and less capable force, if we make that decision, we have to understand that as we come down, we are encouraging others to strive to be near peer. I believe in the long run for the nation, when you look at 20 to 30 year horizon, the cost to the U.S. Treasury in having a strong military that prevents wars is much better than having a weakened military that must respond to more aggressive potential adversaries. Let, let me take a conventional, uh, I guess you took somewhat conventional, but also the nuclear uh, piece of that. But as I said in my opening statement, I think one of the things that we need to be concerned about is uh, China's rising influence in Asia Pacific, not necessarily is going to bring us to combat between the United States and China, but certainly there will be sparring for influence. And when you look at China's need for resources and the resource rich South China Sea and the other nations in the region that have claims on those resources, that I think the best way to work through that in a peaceful, non confrontational way is to have the United States present in the region. And I think as a, as a smaller military, a weakened military, we may not be able to respond in a way that would be able to exert the influence to keep um, conflict from breaking out in a, in a region over resources uh, when you have one very powerful nation and, and several pretty small nations, actually. So I think it goes back to the sort of the honest broker role in the region. Uh, I think we, we play an incredible, incredibly important role there and that any diminution of our capability to do that would, but in the end, harm our own uh, economic uh, prospects. Very briefly, uh, I think that strength allows us to provide a tremendous moderating influence. If you go through the Asia-Pacific region right now and talk to both diplomatic and military leaders, business people, they all are very happy that we're there in the presence we have and in the numbers we have. And when we start doing things like significantly reducing nuclear weapons and the rest, or when we allow proliferation to occur, what happens is they lose that reassurance, and then you hear talk of allies thinking that they need to go nuclear, if you will, and the rest. Those are not reassuring for long-term security.